Right, I, I, and I think you are right that you are going to see those, um, the, the, the assumptions are based on the fact that we are going to see it subsidised for, for going forward. There are sort of EPA rulings that mean there's going to be a certain amount of renewables by 2030, different states applied. And so, yes, it is somewhat um, a, a false market from that perspective. I guess the point that I'm trying to make is that at some point it is going to come, become cost effective for us. And we're not too far away on solar um, for, for this to be done. But... Um, it's, it's interesting the different tax, as I mentioned, that you've seen here in the US. Obviously, there is the, uh, there's, there's more subsidies elsewhere in terms of, like, you'll see uh, New Jersey using more solar than Texas, <laughs> something like that, which seems a little bit crazy. But then in Germany, their, their system there is, is purely subsidised by the people, and they are furious with it. You know, there's a huge backlash there because they're basically saying, oh, we're subsidising all this renewable activity, and then uh, we're, we're giving people money to take our power. And so it's a very difficult balance to, to be struck there. I guess the, the, the main point is, is that at some point we are going to, to need this bridge to take us off of fossil fuels, whether it's in 2030 to 2040. I actually think that's going to be a real sort of decade of change there when it does become cost effective. But to your point, until that time it is going to need to be subsidised. Yeah, John. Yeah, on, your, um, on your gas price, we showed prices from different areas. You use the Henry Hub price, which is obviously higher than, you know, with bulk and Marcel as far as, how does that, that price differential factor in something that was, gas is much more of a localized market than the global market like the oil is? Right. Uh, the majority of the, the uh, LNG export terminals coming through are going to be in the Gulf of Mexico, and all of the pricing has actually been tied to Henry Hub. And so uh, Asia, like Japan, China, India, have been entering into these contracts for Henry Hub plus $2 or something like that. And so um, that's just indicative of them, of them seeing a well-established benchmark and basically punting on the fact that lower prices are going to continue, at least on a localised basis, at Henry Hub there and so um, so it is it, it's very much going to maintain itself as a benchmark I think where you mentioned like Marcellus there where the break-evens are for 75 cents and the prices are just a little bit more than that sometimes you as you see the constraints eased in the Marcellus uh, we will see that gas, whereas it has been going in into the new northeast, we're already seeing those pipelines being reversed to the southeast and across to the like the Rockies pipeline etc we will see um, uh, less of an issue in two, three, four, five years of Marcellus being uh, um, a, a distraction from the other prices, I think. Is that fair? Yeah, let me follow up. Um, you, you talked about the, uh, the, the export terminals uh, being built. Um, I saw an article this morning that I think conjectured there were only going to be five of the actual um, terminals built. When you, you do your models, how many do you also Thanks. anticipate um, coming online and what's the time frame? Sure. Um, it's probably about nine, uh, uh, nine BCF a day, as I mentioned, by 2019. There's this uh, FID, which is like the financial investment decision. So I'm discounting all those ones that are not included in that because I think if you're going to choose to do an export terminal now in the US, you wouldn't do it. It would already be underway. You've already done the approval process. You have to get a license from FERC. You get a license from the Department of Energy. That costs you know hundreds of thousands of dollars to apply for. So to do that, it shows that you're not messing around. You know, um, hundreds of millions. Sorry, uh, and so your projects are um, uh, five billion, etc., ten billion, fifteen billion per even sort of BCF a day of exports for each of those terminals, and so there's probably going to be, yeah, only only a handful, sort of six, uh, the ones that have been approved so far up to that nine BCF a day of capacity. I don't see more than one or two more than that. When even just two three years ago we were looking at 23 terminals. Any other questions? So. What percentage of the petroleum tankers, what's their utilization rate, number one? And how many, what percentage of the petroleum tankers are as being used for just static storage right now? Oh my gosh. <laughs> um, it's, it's very... Jim. Uh, General, well, I can talk about Iran. With Iran, there's probably up to 40 million barrels of, of oil sat there waiting for the, uh, the sanctions to be lifted there. Um, 
In terms of elsewhere, um, these tankers, the tanker prices have been rising. They are, there isn't any kind of uh, crazy glut going on per se. Just what you're seeing is discounting. And so, uh, say, Saudi Arabia is discounting its oil into Asia. Uh, for example, its OSP for August is cheaper. And so that's what you're seeing instead. So, uh, yes, we are sort of oversupplied by this 2 million barrels a day. Um, it's just ha we're just seeing that going into inventories. Like here in the US, we're at a 80-year you know, high. And we've got a strategic petroleum reserve of 700 million barrels. We've got 460 million barrels in commercial stocks. Uh, OECD stocks, so developed nation stocks, um, are like well above their five-year average. They're really strong. And so it's finding its way into storage. Uh, no one really knows about uh, Asia. Um, uh, China is building strategic petroleum reserves, and we think that's why there's, a, there's perhaps a more demand coming through from them than uh, uh, there should be at such a, an economic growth pace. But um, uh, does that answer your question? There's, the, the majority of it is probably uh, is with that, that share of, of Iran. Otherwise, there's probably about 20 million barrels. It's, um, it's a contango thing as well in the market. That was a huge play uh, back earlier in the year when the front month price was around sort of 50, say, and then that, that price was 60, sort of six months out. So people were just renting a tanker, basically, and buying that oil, putting it on the tanker. And as long as the difference of the price they could sell it out here uh, was sort of cheaper than their store, it was higher than the storage price, then they would do that and make that profit. But because that, I should be doing it that way, sorry, because you were the other way around. So, uh, so as that contango has dropped, I'm normally good at that, actually. Uh, so as that contango price has dropped, uh, you've probably seen that storage drop to about 20 million barrels, I read the other day, in terms of elsewhere. But then Iran is its own animal, so maybe 60. Yeah, sure. Uh, okay, so first question, uh, what's the, the grade of it? it about half-half condensate. So half of it is condensate, half of it is, is Iranian oil. Iranian oil is the kind of like uh, a heavy, uh, sorry, sort of a, a, uh, about 30 API, something like that, so not, not too heavy. And so it's kind of sour. It's going to compete with those Saudi and Iraqi barrels. And so that's the first piece of that. In terms of uh, exports now, um, they're exporting about 1.2 million barrels a day. So they're just above that. They, they're, they're capped at 1 million barrels from the, from the sanctions, but then just a little bit more than that is getting out. Uh, but they produce sort of 2.6 at the moment, 2.8, something like that. And so um, a lot of that, the majority of it, is going to India and China, Japan. Um, and so that will probably be... Um, as, as markets open up, um, what you've seen is that because of the U.S. oil boom, uh, you've seen Angolan and Nigerian cargoes displaced from going across to the U.S. and they're going to, into Europe instead. And they've basically displaced the oil that would have been coming from Iran if there wasn't sanctions on it. So now we're going to have this situation where Iranian barrels are going to come back beginning of next year, something like that. And it, it, they may be going to have to be compete with Nigeria, Angola, and then the same grade as the Saudi and the Iraqi oil. I have time for one more question, if there's a remaining question out there. If not, thank you very much, Matt. Thank you. All right, so we're going to break uh, for the morning and move on to the membership luncheon. Um,